October 24, 2000 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the meeting is hereby called to order with a quorum of the board present with uh, Mr. Christashi being the only member absent. Uh, first item on the agenda is the approval of the September 26, 2000 minutes of the meeting of the Z Zoning Board of Appeals. Does anybody have comments regarding the minutes? Under the corrections on um, line 23 on the first page, page 4, so it's been line 14, not line 21. When they went to correct the meeting's minutes from the me meeting before, they realized it was the wrong line number. You're saying on line 23 of these minutes, it refers to page 4, line 21. Yes. It should be page 4, line 14. Line 14. Other comments with regard to the minutes? Uh, page five, line 10. Mr. Kneely said that how is it going to support three bedrooms? I believe what I said was uh, when the septic system was designed to support three bedrooms. Page, what page was it? Page five, line 10 where it currently says, Mr. Keneally said the house could only support three bedrooms. And Mr. Keneally, you're suggesting that that be changed to what? What I had said was that the way the plans were presented to us, the septic system was designed to support only three bedrooms. So would you like that change to say, Mr. Keneally questioned whether the septic system was designed to support three bedrooms? No, actually, what was happening here was Mr. Lurie had talked about an oversized septic system able to support substantially more than three bedrooms, and I was trying to correct the statement that he had made earlier in his presentation. So Mr. Keneally said that the septic system was designed to support, support three only three bedrooms. Mr. Chair, there's Mr. One, Smith. Um, the secretary, um, Glenda, has suggested that, that, and it wasn't, isn't because you just spoke, Jack, but as a general uh, problem with the tape and people not spoke, speaking clear, clearly enough or loud enough, and she's having trouble picking up at certain points certain speakers. So if we could all speak as clearly as possible into the mic, it would be appreciated. Well, this is actually something that I'd also like to address later on in the meeting when we get to, I guess, uh, new business, and that is the manner of keeping the minutes, and okay. we can talk about that. But yeah, I'm sure that it's hard to pick up the tape. Other comments about the minutes? I have a couple. Um, on page two, line 30, it says, Mr. Fristashi asked Mr. Davis if blasting would be required for the addition and our steps proposed. I think what he was asking there um, was, I think it should be Mr. Fristashi asked Mr. Davis if blasting would be required for the addition and whether steps are proposed. Would be more in keeping with Mr. Fristashi's question at the time. And then on page 2, line 42, um, that whole sentence, um, starting with line 41, says, Mr. Traster introduced photos to the board showing views from the top of the page's ho home toward the ocean. And I think we should there have comma, and of the Lakeman's home, as seen from the peak of the roof of the page's home. So after ocean, I would put comma, and then add the words and of, delete the word with, and change the spelling of peak to P-E-A-K, 
rather than P-E-E-K. Um, then I have a more substantive suggestion with regard to page 6, starting on line 40, the findings of fact. There are two findings of fact listed, followed by six conclusions. Um, I don't believe we differentiated our votes between findings and conclusions, and I think we should have that that should be eight findings rather than two findings and then six conclusions. I would propose that they be numbered consecutively one through eight rather than one, two, then one through six. Um, and then with the, so we have some consistent, we with some consistency with the way the votes were recorded. As to finding number one, it's now written, it says vote unanimous six to zero. I think it's ambiguous as to exactly what the vote was. I think it should be vote six in favor, zero opposed. Um, then the second vote, it said, the second finding, the vote is shown there, it says vote affirmative, five to one opposed. And I think that, again, is ambiguous as to what we did and that it should be vote five in favor, one opposed. Um, on page seven, conclusion number one, I would renumber as number three instead of number one. And the vote on that would be, right now it shows the vote is six to zero in favor. I would change that to be vote is six in favor, zero opposed. Then on conclusion number two, I would again remove all reference to conclusion and change two to paragraph number four. I would leave the vote exactly as is. I think that's written correctly. Vote is four in favor, two opposed. Uh, Number three, I would change to five, leave the vote as is, where it says vote is four in favor, two opposed. Uh, number four, I would change to six, leave the vote exactly as it reads, as it reads, which is vote is four in favor, one opposed, and one abstained. Uh, number five, I would change to seven, and it currently reads vote was six to zero in favor. I think that's ambiguous. I would change that to read vote was six in favor, zero opposed. Um, and number six, I would change to number eight. And again, it says vote is six to zero in favor. I would change that to vote is six in favor, zero opposed. Again, I'll just remove any ambiguity about the way those votes were made. <clears throat> Other comments on the minutes? Um. Yeah, on the, the same page, page seven, uh, in paragraph 27, um, says the vote is three in favor, four opposed. I think we only had six members present. I believe the vote couldn't have been three to four. I believe the vote was three to three. Oh, and the motion to reconsider. Yeah. Uh, you're right, we did only have six members present. And I know the vote failed, but I don't remember what the vote was. If it failed, it must have been four to two. Two to two? If it was three to three, it wouldn't have failed. Or, uh, Actually, I think it, w it would have failed at three to three. Oh, that's it, right. it would have required a um, majority. So, um, not having a record uh, before us of what the actual vote was, um, we could change that to say, um, upon vote taken, the motion fails without indicating the precise uh, numerical vote. And this was simply on Mr. Fristashi's motion to reconsider his vote on one of the conclusions. 
Is that change acceptable? if anybody cares to view the videotape, it would show the exact vote on that motion. With those corrections having been made to the minutes, may I have a motion, please? Move to accept the minutes as amended. Second. Motion by Mr. Cronin. Second, Mr. Plant. Um, all those in favor? Opposed and abstaining. One abstention. And that concludes the minutes. <coughs> uh, next item. On the agenda is old business, and the first item under old business is a motion to reconsider, which is a motion, which is an item that I personally requested be placed on the agenda. Um, and the motion is one that I would like to make, and that is a motion to reconsider the September 26, 2000 vote on the motion to approve the application of Ronald and Mary Page, 172 Two Lights Road, for a front beacon lane property line variance of seven feet from the required 25 feet to construct a 16 by 25 foot two-story addition to the existing dwelling. Now, I'm presenting the motion for reasons that were set forth in my September 28 letter to the board, a copy of which was sent to legal counsel for Ronald and Mary Page. Um, and to counsel for the abutters, uh, Dan and Faye Lakeman. The basis for my motion to reconsider is that the board, uh, by affirmative vote of at least four board members, had separately found to be in existence or to be true each of the elements required for the granting of a variance under section 19-5-2B1 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. The board, after making those affirmative findings, then voted to deny the uh, approval of the Pages application for a variance. And immediately after the board's vote, Mr. Traster, as legal counsel for the Pages, requested that the vote reconsider its final vote denying the application on the basis that the vote was inconsistent with the board having found in the affirmative on each of the elements required under the ordinance. Um, as chair at that time, I denied Mr. Traster's request that we reconsider. After the hearing, however, I came to the conclusion that Mr. Traster was correct and that the board should have reconsidered its final vote. I therefore sent a letter to all board members uh, to that effect and indicating my intent uh, to present that motion to reconsider this evening. Um, so that, uh, that is my motion um, and it is presented for a second to the extent that anybody wants to do so, in which case um, it can be discussed and then voted upon. I vote to second the motion. Mr. LaPlante seconds. Uh, discussion on the motion. I would uh, like to offer an amendment to the motion. That well, we I, reconsider. I, technically, um, yeah. a motion to reconsider cannot be amended. Yeah. Um, correct. We, can, we can take this motion up, we can vote it up, we can vote it down, um, and then once that's resolved, you can present any other motion. And uh, I, I concur that, that we should reconsider in light of the, uh, the apparent inconsistency of the board's finding. Other discussion? Um, all those in favor of the motion? Uh, um, five in favor, um, opposed, and Ms. Miller is abstaining since she was not here last month. Uh, so the motion is approved uh, five to zero. Uh, five in favor, zero opposed. The uh, status of the motion at this point 
uh, with the motion to reconsider having been approved is that the original motion, which was made by Mr. Keneally, to approve the uh, Page's application for a variance is now on the table uh, for discussion or vote, unless Mr. Keneally would like to withdraw uh, his motion. I would like to amend the motion. May I do that? Um, would you first withdraw the motion? And perhaps make a certainly. new one if you would rather? Certainly. I'll okay. withdraw. Are there any objections to Mr. Keneally withdrawing the motion, which was the motion to approve the Page's application for a variance? Okay, there being no objections, um, the motion of Mr. Keneally is withdrawn as originally presented. So we are now sitting with a clean slate, so to speak, with no motions currently before us. Mr. Keneally. I'd like to move that we approve the application based on the fact that the board has determined by an affirmative vote uh, that each of the elements required for approval of the application has been found to be true. Do we have a second to that motion? I second the motion. Mr. Plant. Discussion on that motion. Since this re uh, represents a, a departure from where the board has traditionally uh, operated, uh, my concerns are as follows. And if this is, sounds like two bites at the apple, uh, that's, and, and I'm voted down on it, I understand that you know, the board members' positions. When I listened to the appeal, I had decided that it failed on criteria uh, 2i. Uh, the fact that, that it, what I thought it failed referred to a definition of a definition of a definition contained in a definition contained in a reference to the, uh, to, to, the, to the term practical difficulty. And I voted initially to approve on 2i, uh, and that was probably my mistake. But having satisfied myself that the motion to approve, that I would not vote for it because the ANCAT failed essential criteria, I think I failed to give due, due diligence to uh, the terms of uh, uh, little i2, that is, the de that a practical difficulty existed. And I know Mr. I believe Mr. Fastacci voted uh, against that motion, and I voted with the majority in saying that. Uh, to do I believe, is that correct? Do we? That's my recollection. Anyway, this is a new ordinance. Uh, and new criteria for granting of a variance. And I don't think we had a very good handle on it. I think the fact that we had a very productive meeting with the town attorney that lasted several hours, where we discussed openly uh, the uh, ramifications and the criteria we have uh, of the new ordinances, uh, and it came to a better understanding of it. In light of that, I would like to reconsider voting on the various criteria and uh, all eight, in fact, although I realize that may be out of order, on the grounds that having once made up my mind that the, that the conditions were not met, I didn't give due diligence and wasn't aware enough of the ramifications of the various criteria to give a full hearing to it. In other words, it became moot once I decided that uh, it didn't meet the one criteria I really didn't give the other ones enough thought, just trying to wrestle with what I thought was the main issue. So I think in fairness, if we're going to, it sounds like uh, I'm getting two bites at the apple here, as, as lawyers uh, are prone to say, uh, to reconsider votes on the various criteria. However, if we're going to change procedures and have the final vote be an affirmation of the, of the individual votes, which is the way we have not proceeded in the past, then I think it behooves us in the interest of fairness to start out from a really clean slate and to go down to this, the various conditions again. Now, that's just the way I feel. And I feel voted down. Uh, that's, that's fine, too. Uh, but I would like to uh, uh, move for reconsideration of at least the criteria against which I voted, uh, in fact, where I voted with the majority. 
Well, if, if the board would like to reconsider, um, as Mr. Cronin is suggesting, the eight elements that we voted on separately, then the motion of Mr. Keneally should either be withdrawn or we should vote on it and it would have to be denied because if his motion is approved, um, then I think we're at the conclusion of this. Um, if the board is inclined to, uh, to reconsider each of the elements, each of the, each of the eight findings that we had made last month, the last meeting, then it's probably premature to vote on a motion to approve everything as it now stands. I'll, I will withdraw my motion. Yeah, we'll, we'll point of order, Mr. Chairman. My, my motion has not been seconded yet. I realize that. No, that's why well, I'm withdrawing that. my I, motion. I, it's, it's, it's not even a motion, I think, to be made until we resolve the motion that we now have. Uh, we had a motion before us that we needed to act on, uh, right. which is Mr. Keneally's. Okay. I stand corrected. So Mr. Keneally is offering to withdraw I his will. motion to approve the pages application. Are there any objections to, to the withdrawal of that motion now? Which then again leaves us with a clean slate to start with a new motion if one is to be presented. So there being no objections to the withdrawal of Mr. Keneally's motion, which is a motion to approve the pages application, that motion is withdrawn and now Mr. Cronin, apparently, would like to make a motion. I move to reconsider the votes on I, double I, uh, one, three, four, five, and six. Having voted in the minority on two, it's, in a, it's out of order for me to make the motion to reconsider. Well, there are actually I, double I, and A through F. Yeah, A through F. So, You're asking to reconsider I, double I, A, C, D, E, and F? Correct. That's right. So the only one of the findings that you voted against last week was, um, I believe paragraph was. B. Yes. You voted in favor of all others. I believe I did. Is there a second to the motion? I'd just like some clarification. Are we? We're not going to consider all the votes. Well, technically, Mr. Cronin doesn't have the right to move to reconsider uh, a vote that he was on the losing side of. And he voted in the minority as to 29-5-2B1 small b, which is the paragraph that starts out saying the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. He was, he was one of two people who voted um, against that finding. I was the other. So he can't properly move to reconsider that. Only somebody who voted with the prevailing side can move to reconsider. So if somebody who was on the prevailing side of subparagraph B of that vote, which would be somebody other than Mr. Cronin or myself, wants to move to reconsider the vote on that, uh, they could do that, but Mr. Cronin can't.
So procedurally, we have a motion in front of us with no second. Hearing no second, we have no motion. The motion fails for lack of a second. Is there another motion to be made? <coughs> Mr. Keneally, would you like to represent your motion? Yes, having given Mr. Cronin an opportunity to present his motion, I'll represent the motion that I made, which was uh, we approve the application based on the fact that the board has determined by an affirmative vote that each of the elements required for approval of the application has been found to be true. Um, would you change that to have it clarified that it was by a, an affirmative vote of at least four board members? Yes, I accept that. Is there a second to that motion? I second that motion. Second, Mr. LaPlante. Uh, discussion on the motion. My understanding, this, this is a motion that recognizes how we voted on the individual criteria and our logical commitment to approve of the variance based upon that vote. Is that my, is that, do I have a correct understanding of the motion before us? Yes, it is a motion to approve based upon the fact that each of the elements was individually approved by a majority vote. By a majority, not by a majority vote, but by a vote of at least four individual board members. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Five in favor, opposed? Not opposed, abstention, Ms. Miller. Uh, that concludes the Motion to reconsider on the Pages application uh, for a variance and the application of the Pages to for a variance of seven feet from the required 25 feet to, to construct a 16 by 25 foot two-story addition to the existing dwelling at 172 Two Lights Road, tax map U15, lot 5 is approved. The next item of business is to discuss the cover letter that accompanies applications. Mr. Chair, you need uh, Attorney Hill. Um, is there anything that we are to cover tonight? Actually, maybe there are a couple things that we could <laughs> keep Mr. Hill for for a little bit. So, um, maybe we could take something out of order. Can we skip this item um, and move on to a couple other things that Mr. Hill might be of assistance on? Um, if we can come back to the discussion of the cover letter that accompanies applications and move to the discussion of uh, changes to the rules and regulations of the board. And we have in our packet a copy of the existing rules with a modification <coughs> Uh, that has been made at the suggestion of the town attorney, Mr. Hill. Does everybody have those rules? Bruce, you have another copy of that? I can't find mine. Bruce? 
Give another copy of that. I don't think so. I just gave Mr. Hill a last copy. Okay. I guess and I yeah. correct me, Bruce, if if I'm wrong on the, on this, but my understanding is that the only proposed change is in section five, paragraph B. Is it a new paragraph two? Is that the only change? That and, and the uh, uh, change from building inspector to CEO, code enforcement officer. Where, where, where it says code enforcement officer, it used to say building inspector. That's the only two changes, yes. Okay, so the primary change, section five, paragraph B, dealing with applications, paragraph two. And this is a suggested change that came about for a number of reasons, but primarily because the board was trying to avoid being handed a large quantity of exhibits on the evening of the hearing for the first time. So, comments on this? I'm not sure that this precludes that from happening. It says, when it talks about late submissions, I assume that's late submissions of applications, not late submissions of supporting material. So I don't, I don't really interpret that to have any influence on what we're concerned about. Well, you're right. Um, and the board, under its rules, is it under these rules or is it under the ordinance itself? Um, no, it's under these rules, section four. It says the rules shall not be dispensed with or suspended unless a majority of the board consent thereto. No matter what the rules are, we always have the opportunity to vary from them under whatever circumstance we want. But I guess the objective is to encourage people to give us what they have ahead of time so we're not looking at it for the first time. This applies to all matters before the board? It appears to. Now, is this by way of excluding submissions at the time of uh, presentations? I mean, a person could still come in and cite this case, that case, the other case, uh, but we would not be, we would not accept written copies of decisions and whatnot at that time. Is that what we're saying? Well, I think so. Um, I wrote, let me read you what sort of I wrote as I was reading through this over the weekend. It Maybe something to try and address this a little bit. Applicants are encouraged to provide copies of all supporting materials with the application. The board shall reserve the right to table an application to its next meeting if the applicant presents supporting materials at the time of the hearing and the board determines that additional time is necessary to fully and adequately consider the supporting materials. Applicants and all other parties shall label all supporting materials with identifying descriptions to permit easy reference to the materials during the hearing. Um, example, applicants exhibit one, exhibit two, et cetera, or um, John Smith's exhibit one, two, et cetera. The reason I, I wrote both of those was as much as we require somebody or encourage them, we're not always going to get everything in advance. There will be things that they come up with at the last minute, and we want to reserve the discretion, I think, to always permit somebody to present something at the hearing, um, especially when people aren't represented by counsel and they're not used to preparing for this kind of a presentation. They're going to come up with things at the last minute. But what we do want to avoid is when somebody hands us 15 different documents, I think we want to reserve the right at that point to table the hearing, especially if we think it might require another site visit when we're given descriptions of surrounding properties, which we have had happen to us. Um, 
and we've been given documents many times where we're all shuffling papers up here and we're not quite sure what the witness is referring to because they're not labeled in any sense. And there's no formal way of keeping track of what has actually been presented as an exhibit and by who it's been presented unless there's a record being kept that I'm unaware of. We don't mark exhibits, do they, as to who presents them? So at the end of the hearing, we have a lot of loose documents without any clear indication as to whether an applicant or an abutter or someone else may have presented the documents we have in our record, correct? That's correct. Um, I think that's something that we have to address um, and that we should keep some track of who's presenting the documents that we're receiving into evidence as part of the record of the hearing. So whether we want to take the responsibility at the time they're presented, um, whether um, staff should assume that responsibility for labeling all exhibits um, as to who they're presented by with a number, or whether we should put that burden on the applicant to make sure that whatever they're going to present is labeled with their name will be enough um, in Exhibit 1 and Exhibit 2. And if they're going to present seven copies up here, each one of those should be marked. So if somebody has a question about an exhibit, they can refer to it by name and number. I think that would certainly help in a lot of cases clarify what we're doing. It, it, it would be, it's no problem for the staff to, to do that, but it would not the, no, the applicant wouldn't have that information when they presented it, so that would be a problem. So it probably ought to be right. the And it would take a lot of time when you're marking not only the applicant or objector's copy, but all of our copies. Um, it's going to consume a tremendous amount of hearing time uh, that would be wasted. So I'd like to see it done in advance, and whatever they're going to present, just have them right at the top or on the bottom, their name. Yeah, exhibit one, exhibit blanks two. In some time is like pulling teeth, so. Well, I know, we'll but I'm just to trying try to make some headway on what's already a difficult situation, but I'm, and I'm trying to keep it as sort of informal as possible, <laughs> not requiring applicants and objectors, numbers and letters and what the courts might require, but a, a name and a number would be sufficient, just so we have something to refer to. So or say or even look. if they if they made a, a binded copy of their presentation, then it would... Well, that's almost too much to ask for. That would be a dream well, come true if they actually had a binder I with all their exhibits. I think I could probably easily get them to do it in a binder than I would be to label each one, but I, I guess we could give them the option. I think short of being a federal judge, we're not in a position to order somebody to bring that into us. <laughs> um, and then the other part of this was the thought that can I comment on the first part? Oh, sure. First, it's I the on all modification or amend amendments that you suggested to the wording of B2 there. Um, your suggestion that we tell the applicant uh, in this, or that we've now given ourselves a new power to table the uh, submission or the application of submissions in the we already have that power. It's a power we already have. Uh, I would prefer to see it say, the submission will be tabled unless the board votes otherwise. Well, that puts more of a burden on the applicant to have things prepared fully two weeks ahead of time. It still provides for exceptions, that rather than have the burden be on us with the wording that you've proposed and in which we already have that power, I'd rather put the, the burden more on the applicant. I agree, I think that's an excellent yeah. point. I like that. If I can comment just a little bit on the exhibit. I, I agree that there should be some organized fashion. I'm worried that rather than putting a burden on us, we've now put a burden on Bruce Smith. Um, and it sounds like getting everybody to fill out an application completely is a difficult task for him. And I certainly, he's conveyed some sentiment that this will make it harder for him. And I'm, I'm concerned about that. I don't want to make his job any more difficult than it can be. So maybe we should have it more vague and put it um, something similar language you proposed, but rather than saying exhibits, 
organize the exhibits in an identifiable fashion and allow it to be such that the applicant can make that discretion and um, maybe it takes an extra minute to organize it. But if, it's, if it takes us an extra minute, the hearing, as opposed to taking Bruce and his staff extra minutes, I'd rather just have us try to identify it as clearly as we can in the hearing. And another way to do it is simply to take that responsibility on ourselves. And that is, as somebody presents exhibits and they present seven copies of it, we say, OK, let's mark this one, applicant's exhibit number one. And everybody can just write it on their document at the time so that there is a record of that. And I, I, I think the board has just been remiss in making any formal record of what exhibits have come in. And that concerns me. It would, it would take a minute just to do that, go through and just identify them quickly for the record. The other thing is that we don't always refer to everything for the record. And I think probably Bruce keeps a, a staff cop, an office copy, yeah. so that if the record was created for appellate purposes, Bruce has got a complete record. Um, and if they choose to identify something, we can make it mark it as an exhibit. At that point, when they identify it and reference it, or one of the board members does. Mr. Hill. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Uh, I was immediately nodding my head when you were saying that they should be labeled because that's what I'm used to in court. Everything would be labeled, so I find that appealing. But I, I, uh, I agree with what Ms. Miller was saying, that I think it would be better if the board does that because I don't believe that the applicants are going to do that and it will be shifting everything to uh, Mr. Smith's office. And. In a lot of cases, you may not need to go through, and uh, uh, it, it may not be as big of a deal. I can think of a couple right. of cases where it was important to know which photograph we're talking about, and it would be very helpful to have uh, the board label that exhibit or that photo. Um, but I, I guess I'd rather not see it be a, more of a burden on the staff to do that. Well, then, as a matter of protocol, I think that we as a board should simply make sure that any time something is presented to us that we just take a minute to say, okay, this will be exhibit number five or A or whatever we want to use so we can refer to it. Because it, it's more for identification later in the record than as in a court of law where you'd be moving to admit an exhibit, exhibit five, whatever and objections for that, and it might be left, you know, uh, not admitted. We don't have those rules of evidence. Right. So it's more just for identification in the record so we can rely on that later if, if there were an appeal or just to make our minutes clearer that that, that was what was, that's what, that was the piece of evidence we were relying on in making our decision. So. Usually the packets are fairly organized until they get to the to hear and then people start throwing things at us and that, that's when it becomes a, a kind of a problem at that point. I mean, at that point everything becomes a bit. Okay, well then why don't we as a board simply resolve to do a better job of keeping track of everything that's given to us? I would like to see the, the information which comes to us in the packet to, I, it seems to me it would be um, to the applicant's advantage to at least have um, an index which lists the items in the packet, which would be a good reference tool once you get up here. And afterwards, if once we're in, in session, they want to submit evidence at that point, then we would take up your point of, of labeling it at that, at that time, maybe just an extension of their index. But I would like to see it a little bit better prepared when it comes in packet form by the applicant. It shouldn't default to your office. Um, it's to their advantage to prepare a better presentation. And I always recommend that. And, and, and as, you, as you notice, sometimes an applicant, even when there's not an attorney involved, is, it's very neat and organized. And other times, it's very right. uh, erratic. So I think it's important to go out to the applicant that this is the threshold that needs to be met before you appear before the board. Right. But I, I certainly, from staff's standpoint anyways, if I, if I, if I tell an applicant they need, that's to their advantage to be organized, and they don't heed that advice, I would think it would 
behoove the board to make a decision whether it is organized or not, but then don't just turn it away without even looking at it, because some cases are a lot less complicated than others. And some of them ones that you may turn away for more information, you'll never get any more than that, because that, that's all they can provide. Right. I mean, short of me sitting down and fill out the, filling out the application, which I have done on several occasions. Well, not in my handwriting, but I've hel helped them with the wording and, and the, you know, uh, at a good, good many times that happens, so. Um. Bruce, do you have a model application that they, they can look at, how to fill this out? Would that we, be? We have had, at times, posted model applications on the, on the bulletin board mm -hmm. and, and passed them out, yeah. Would, but that, would, would that be helpful if we said, this is what we'd like to see, here's your application, here's your exhibits, they're identified, you know. Applicants exhibit one, applicants exhibit two, but say here, if you try and come up with something that approximates this. Well, since, since, you, since the board has required uh, submission of at least a, a, a mortgage inspection for every application, that is, that was one of the things that was really very poorly done was site plans. Mm -hmm. Since you require at least that much, that's taken that element um, and made that a better situation. The application is clear and they have to fill in the blanks. So uh, supporting documentation, you know, it's up to them to organize it. And I don't know how we can, there, there's no model out there for organizing without shot of telling them that they have to have an index and they have to have this and that and the other thing. Well, a little model there that designating, illustrating that, say illustrating, not requiring, is what would be most helpful with, I think. There again, if worth it, coming it, it still boils down to the person you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. If they listen yes. and they want to and they want to do a good job, they'll do a good job. If if they don't want to do a job or are not capable of doing a the job, then not, no matter what you give them, it's going to be the same situation. I understand what you're saying, but it isn't as easy as that. I know the planning board always takes a vote uh, that the application is complete. They didn't even start debate until they take a vote that the application is complete. Well, they had the luxury of having a workshop before. This board does. So they can they can certainly get have their applicant much more organized at the workshop. Um, the, uh, the, the applicant walks away at the workshop knowing exactly what the board needs, and that's an advantage the planning board can afford. But I don't believe the board of appeals can do that. So is following up on Mr. Keneally's um, comment and suggestion. Um, do the board members like the idea of saying that if in the event supporting written documentation is submitted by the applicant for the first time at the hearing that the matter will be tabled unless the vote affirm unless the board affirmatively votes otherwise? I like that a lot. Yeah. I, think that's I do as well. Yeah, I agree. That obviously gives us great latitude to move forward with it. Mr. Chair, can I comment on that? Sure. Please um, do. I think that's a good thing, but I don't think you should start discussion and then decide halfway through that, well, we got too much in front of us, we're going to table it. If you, if you, I think that should be up front. It's too much before us, we're tabling it. Because too often it's not, and, and, and I'm not saying this is a criticism, that a board will get to a point where they're not quite sure how they want to vote. And sometimes they look for a way to, to buy themselves some time. And I think that's unfair to the applicant at that point. Well, we could simply begin each hearing by asking the applicant or his attorney, if they have an attorney, whether we have all the supporting material that goes with their application. That, that's the way we'd have to do it yeah. if we're going to yeah. make that decision before we So that brings it right up front at the beginning of the hearing. And then depending on, upon what they submit to us, taking a quick glance at it and drop. Or, or, or Bruce, were you referring to before we start discussion or before we start to hear evidence? No, what, what I'm suggesting is if, if somebody slips you a packet that's eight pages long, that you don't start to that you look at that and say, this is too much, and say, we're well, tabling it. Don't start the thing, go a half an hour into it, and then, then say, well, we've got too much here. To, you know, that's correct. That's, it happens more often than not, and not just this board. I mean, that's, 
I'm on a Board of Appeals, or I was, and we used to do the same thing. Now, what everybody has to understand is that we're dealing only with the applicant, as opposed to objectors. And an objector might like nothing more than present to present us with a huge packet of stuff for the purpose of getting the hearing delayed and continued because there's no way you can control that though. That's right, we can't. So um, often a delay at that point will be a victory for the objecting abutters. So this it's is the <laughs> pardon? It's only a thirty day victory. Well they can keep coming up with new stuff to present. Um, yeah, that, which went, that went to close the public hearing, I suppose. Well, the, the point is, I mean, if, 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 if they don't, if we never move to making a decision, they can't lose. What if um, they did something? So I think that this restriction only applies to the applicant, not, abutters are always going to present us with new things at the time of the hearing, and we have yes, to recognize that. Can we determine what the, uh, the opposition will be presenting? at the onset of the hearing? Or is it appropriate to ask that? Well, the, the nature of an objection is responsive to what is presented yes. by the applicant. So they oftentimes don't know exactly what their presentation will be until they hear what has been presented. Um, they can probably give us a pretty good sense, but not necessarily all of it. They also will have materials with them. They might not run out little hearing to get different materials. So maybe in the when we call things to order, <coughs> you can ask for any submissions to be considered for any business that evening to be submitted at that time. You will get our packages, and at that point we can assess whether they're too much and too voluminous to go through them, and we can decide at that point whether to table or not. And I think what we could do is. Um, tack on some language to Mr. Keneal in that we can say, um, I think your language was that we may, we shall table it unless we vote otherwise. We yeah. shall table it at the beginning of the presentation or the beginning of the uh, meeting unless otherwise. We can just narrow when we can table it or when we make that decision. But I think his language will still be, will still workable and I think that would be fine. This language that's on this application was, was written by Mr. Hill as a result of the exact same discussion because there was a real, real problem then and we couldn't be, you couldn't be too specific but you needed to have something that was going to work and, and um, let, me, let me offer some language just as a straw man to be added on to what's already in here and too and we can kick around it as a straw man anyway and refine it, add to it, delete it. Excuse me, I'm going to have to excuse myself. I have to drive to Boston tonight. I'm running out of steam. I'm going on vacation. For Mr. Cronin, you are excused. Thank you for joining us tonight. We know you made a special effort to do that. Have a good vacation, Bob. Let me suggest some language that would read something like this. Submission of any supporting materials later than 14 days before the board meeting will automatically result in a tabling of the application for one additional month unless the board votes to approve a special exception to this. What about votes to approve a special exception to this at the initiation of the meeting or at the commencement or the beginning of the meeting? And that'll take care of some of the concerns Mr. Smith had. At the onset of the meeting or at the onset, the onset of the presentation. Consideration or something like that. Yeah. As, a, as, a, as a result of, of that same meeting that we talked about um, on the application, I put wording on the application based on the fact that we were grappling with this and, and, and that was the wishes of the board that an incomplete application or not submitting supporting documentation with your application may result in the zoning board tabling your variance appeal to the next meeting causing you additional delay. So they realize when they get their cover letter that that's a definite possibility. I'd rather have it be it's, it's the default position. It will happen unless the board provides for a special exception. And, and I, I, I think that, that would definitely put the burden on the applicant, right. and that's fine. I do think that procedurally there would have to be a vote to table, but you're, mm -hmm. you're saying in your regulations that this is what you're going to do. 
and but I, I, I don't think that it bypasses the need for that vote to take. But you're but you're making a strong position, right? Uh, and advising the applicant that they're going to have to uh, comply with this, or it will be. I'd like to make a motion to accept um, the language that was read in momentarily. Go. Mr. Keneally, would you mind repeating that? <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, I, I expect that you'll probably want to say make some refinements to it, so that's why I called it a straw man. Uh, submission of any supporting materials later than 14 days before the board meeting will automatically result in a tabling of the application for one additional month unless the board votes to approve a special exception to this at the onset of consideration, or the, at the onset of... The presentation? Presentation, sure. I wonder if it would be appropriate to let uh, Mr. Hill have that and... Chew on it? Tweak it, in, tweak it into a final form that maybe could be presented to us next month, at which time we could formally approve the changes to the rule. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. I make a motion to do that too. <laughs> Seconded. Well, why don't we why don't we do that? Why don't we simply ask okay. Mr. Hill to incorporate the essence of uh, Mr. Keneally's proposal um, into the rules to present to us uh, to formally consider next month? Would you do that for us, Mr. Hill? Yes, I will. Thank you. I'd be happy to. One small question I have here, uh, Bruce, uh, maybe for you or maybe for Mr. Hill also. This says at least 14 days before the meeting. Now I noticed in looking through the cover letters that support for the applications, um, they're all 15 days except the application for a variance which is 14 days. Is there any reason? For that, or is well, that actually the one that I included with your packet um, this month is the one that that, that that has got the latest, which is 14 days. Well, I have one for an administrative appeal. I have one for conditional use. Right, that was the old ones that I had given you. But this, I, 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 I think this is the only one I put in this packet, didn't I? That may be. I think I've been carrying the old ones around with me since we put it on the agenda four months ago. And I, I didn't see any need to go to have all those because they, they really followed suit. So I just went with the one, made the 14 days, and this okay. is the one I'd like you to fine tune, and then I'll do the rest according. Fair enough. 15, 14, <laughs> it's a Tuesday, two weeks prior. I don't know, is that 15 or 14? <laughs> Okay. Question. In view of the discussion just earlier regarding documentation, how are we going to deal with opposing or abutting documentation presented at time of, of presentation? Will this affect that in any way? Um, it, it won't affect it. Um, somebody objecting. Uh, to an application would not be required to submit materials 14 days in advance. And I think that what the board simply has to be mindful of is that I guess we always have the opportunity to table something if evidence is presented in a quantity or a, a quality that we think we can't act that evening. But we want to bear in mind that we don't want to table something to benefit an objector who may be intentionally trying to overload us with materials at the last minute. Yeah, that's a good point. And that could very easily happen if somebody appealed and my administrative appeal my decision. They could they could easily do that for stall tactic. So I think we'll just have to take those up as, as they come. Right, and you may have a situation where um, an objector submits a ton of material and the applicant may wish to have an opportunity to uh, digest that and submit additional 
supporting evidence uh, to his position. So, but I don't know. I I I don't come to every meeting. I only uh, come when we know there's going to be a problem. <coughs> so I don't know whether it you have had a lot of instances where you've been overloaded with objectors. I. When I've been here, most of the time, objectors might have one or two things, and mostly it's comments and not a ton of written material. But that may just be, you know. Well, that's, that's usually. So I, I uh, well, I think that that could be a problem. I, I, it hasn't been something that I've seen a lot of. I'll bring it up in view of the fact that this last issue, uh, the uh, majority of the documentation was, was issued by the uh, abutter. I, this won't address that. And you'd have to address that on a case-by-case -case basis whether you feel you need time, additional time to uh, review that. OK, I think we're done with the rules Okay. for now. Um, one other thing, Mr. Hill, before you leave, yeah. if we could take up before we go back to the cover letter. Um, and that is, um, if we could sort of jump forward, um, I guess, to something that's not on the agenda, which would be new business while well, Mr. Hill is here. And that is a discussion of the format of the minutes. Um, the minutes right now include a lot of discussion that seems to be unnecessary to be included in the minutes. <coughs> At least it seems to me that way, but I'd like Mr. Hill's input on whether all that commentary is essential and whether we could do staff and ourselves a huge favor by having the minutes only reflect formal action taken on the matters that are before us without Mr. Backer said or Mr. Keneally said or Ms. Miller said. I personally, I like having that narrative you in do. the minutes. I do. Um, I'm sure it makes more work. <laughs> well, if it, if it helps at all, the minutes were nine pages. I got them scaled to seven before they got to you. So, <laughs> I guess my concern is that when you go back and look at them, even a month later, it's very hard to get a sense of what really went on during the hearing. And for somebody who wasn't present to look at the minutes, no matter how much time has passed, if they weren't present and they read the minutes and the commentary, I think that it would offer very little in the way of substance and flavor as to what really transpired during the hearing. And I wonder whether just sort of the selective nature in which those comments are put in the minutes, whether it's more detracting and confusing than helpful. But I, I I'd love to have everybody I strongly with, with what you're saying. Um, in fact, I, I believe on occasion what shows up in the minutes to me sometimes seems like even a misleading sense of what actually happened. Um, so I think by nature they have to be abridged to some degree. Certainly. I think very frequently they're abridged to a degree that actually takes out important parts of the meaning of what transpired. Certainly. I've seen minutes where it, it, they just reflect uh, uh, who made the motion and what the vote was. and and. You know, identify that such and such a, a matter came before the board, that there was discussion, motion made, seconded, and the, and the vote. I mean, I certainly have seen those. And maybe also identifying the individuals who spoke in favor of and against any particular matter before the board. Bruce, how long does the town keep the videotapes of the hearings? Do you know? I think we've been keeping them ever since we started recording, um, which hasn't been that long, but we keep them. I don't know what the law states on that. I, I'm not sure what the, how long you would have to keep them, but I mean, you don't erase them uh, no, we don't. 60 days later, reuse the same tape. The, uh, the courts okay. don't care about video anyway, so they want audio, right? Uh, well, I think that they, I, you know, they can review the videotape and that, that has been submitted before on ADB appeals as part of the record. Whether the court reviews them or not, I, 
I doubt it. I think that they look at the written transcript and the references to it. We but keep them. And keep the, them. the written transcript, when one is prepared, is taken from the cassette tapes. It's we're re we're recorded on cassette tape outside also. Outside firm. Yeah, it's, um, it's been done by a court reporter who transcribes the, and, and sometimes we've given the court reporter the video too because they may not be able to tell who said what. And it, it's a time consuming yeah. Yeah. process. Well, the reason I ask, obviously, is to the extent that somebody really wanted to see the details of the discussion rather than read the minutes, if the videotape is available, there's no better source to review the discussion. And it's certainly superior to whatever we have in our minutes. So as counsel, do you have Well, I, I mean, again, personally, I like the more detail in, in the minutes, and, I, and again, a lot of times I'm not here, and I, so I'm reading those minutes, and that gives me, I think, a flavor of what, what has happened, and I think we've been fortunate with Linda and, and her predecessors to have very thorough minutes, but uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with having uh, more abridged minutes as to who spoke, the, the motion made, seconded, and the vote. I really don't have a, a strong opinion of it because, as you say, we have the backup material. It, it, it is, uh, it's not necessary to have those minutes go into detail. And particularly if you feel that it's misleading, if some of the minutes have been misleading, it, 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 it would remove that, uh, that issue from the minutes. I think sometimes it is misleading. And I, despite our best efforts when we review the minutes at the following meeting to make little corrections, um, sometimes I recognize the feeble effort that that is to really provide a good sense of what went on during the meeting. Experience also tells me that there is a greater chance that the transcript or the minutes will be misleading the more complex the case, and we've had a couple of cases this year which fall in that category. And my concern would be that those written minutes, if they are now taken by a court as the official record of what they happened, were, uh, they can be very misleading. Right. The, um, I, I, I understand that point. The, the minutes really are not, um, in my experience on ADB appeals, what has been what's relied on by either party or the court because we have a transcript and references are typically made to the to the transcript. So to the extent that somebody might try to take advantage of a statement in the minutes that might be misleading, uh, if the record shows what really happened is different than the minutes, uh, you know, you're not gonna get too far in your argument by Okay. By so so routinely if it goes to appeal there will be a court reporter We'll come up with a formal record based we'll, on we'll the video. Yes, right. we'll okay. transcribe. I was not aware of that. Yeah. Okay. That's, the first thing, that's the first thing they ask for when they're going to appeal it. Right. Plus is a transcript. Right. That delays some of my concerns then. Yeah. That, Nobody, that's why I didn't have, have a that. If that's all we were relying on, mm -hmm. you know. We'd keep them real short. It's a tough thing for, for a secretary to sit to a three-hour meeting and try to pick out those things that are important. And believe it or not, I've said things that I've read in the, in the, in the minutes. I say, I said that? And then I'll go back and check it on the tape, and I did. But it really, without something before and something after, it's taken out of context. It's just like a, an article in the paper, right? Exactly. If, you don't, if they don't quote the whole... Yeah. Right, well, and it's to that extent that they can be misleading. That's true. Not we don't mean misleading in an intentional evil no. sense, right. but just right. things taken out of context and without the overall flow, it's hard to know where the discussion was going. Yes, definitely. We can, um, we can certainly work on abbreviating. Well, what's everybody's sense points. on 
Why? The best way to do the minutes. If these are not something that routinely get used in court, in the case of an appeal, I would say stay with what we have. They do form some kind of a, an easy record to refer to. Even rarely, though they, they rarely may be do misleading, we. But if, I'm concerned about they be legally misleading, and from what Mike has said, that they'll be dispensed with. Basically. That, that hasn't, yeah, that hasn't been my experience. But I, there certainly is that that yeah. potential. Yeah. So, if the board felt that uh, you wanted more abbreviated minutes, I, I certainly have no opposition to that. Yeah, I, I know. The, uh, the reason I concurred initially was that. In two of these complex cases we've had this year, I mean, if I go back and look at the minutes of that, there were so many twists and turns and so forth, and, and the minutes, there's no way a bridge minutes like that could do a faithful job of describing what happened. Mm -hmm. so, but if that's not important legally... The, tra the transcript is, is it. Right. And uh, I'm fine with it. I think that the board's done this for a long time. I think that we probably should keep it. I think they're probably... The minutes are kept at the library, the zoning board's um, actions. The town council has minutes. I think it, the school board has minutes. I think to break that would be for no real reason. Um, we do have the transcript. This isn't a transcript, and it's not alleging to be anything other than just a summary of what we've done for the public to see and maybe for us to go back if need be. Um, I know even today I wasn't at the last meeting and a couple times referred back to the minutes just for the sake of finding out what the vote was, finding out what the general topics of conversation were. And yes, it's not thorough um, in the sense that it's abbreviated. It does give you some guidance. And I think that there would be um, a disservice to us all just to throw that by the wayside. And I think that's compounded by the fact that our attorney here says that he likes to use them and does read them on a monthly basis. And I, I think that's more compelling of a reason right there. Sorry. <laughs> I think it's also difficult. That's good. That's I think it's also difficult to say what to abridge them to. Um, it's going to be arbitrary as to what's determined to be important. So under the current format, it basically, like Mr. Hill says, captures the flavor of the meeting adequately. And I would also remind Mr. Hill that tapes are sold in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think uh, we're finished then with need for legal counsel this evening. So thank you, Mr. Hill, for coming tonight, and we'll go on with the rest of our work. First inning of the uh, game. <laughs> Lucky you. Tape it for us. <laughs> no mats. Those will be available too. <laughs> okay, well then let's go back to, um, I think the only matter that we have left to do is to go back to the discussion of the cover letter. Um, and Bruce, am I correct that the only cover letter we need to look at is the application for a variance? Correct. Okay. The only comment I have is that maybe we want to wait and do this simultaneous with the, the rules and regulations that Mr. Hill is proposing um, to see if maybe number three with respect to the supporting documentation or the first introductory, para introductory paragraph with respect to the incomplete application um, maybe results in tabling um, just so that they're consistent rather than piecemealing it and doing some of this tonight and some of it next month. Well, let's ask Mr. Smith. I know he's been waiting for a long yeah. time for us to address this. Uh, what specific concerns, if any, do you have that you'd like us to address, or are you bringing it to us merely because we have raised it with you? You would, you would raise it with me, so as a result, I <clears throat> made sure that some of your wishes okay. were incorporated in the cover letter, and, and I think it's an easy enough thing to to take care of tonight, or would hope it's been going on for about three or four months, anyways. Not that I don't want to go home and watch a game either, but. Well, I agree with Ms. Miller. We may certainly want to change some of the introductory <coughs> language to be consistent with what we do with the rules with regard to requiring uh, supporting documentation. Um, Go down to the um, third paragraph on the bottom that says, if the appeal is approved. Um, I'd like to go through that language a little bit and see if we can clean that up a little bit. If the appeal is approved, it is the applicant's responsibility to record the variance at the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds within 90 days. Then it's, it's this next, next sentence that I 
had a question about. A building permit will then be issued after application with the appropriate fee. Bruce, what is that referring to? A building permit will then be issued. What's the then? After, after the variance is recorded? By law, I can't, I can't issue a, a building permit on a variance until after it's recorded. Oh, it has to be, it, so the, it is the recording? Yes. Okay, I just wasn't quite sure. So maybe we could just say after, after the variance is recorded, the building permit will be issued. Then they make a separate application? Well, the application that they initially make for a variance, for instance, is denied, and that denial is taken to the Board of Appeals for, for variance, and they, right. they, they have a check returned to them. So they can either drop it or take it to the Board of Appeals. If they're successful in the variance, then they have to reapply. For the building permit. For the building permit. So, how, so you would want that? Well, I was merely unclear as to what the then referred to. A building permit will then be issued. And you've clarified that, that it refers to the recording of the variance. And I wonder if we could simply say that by having the sentence say, after the variance is recorded, a building permit will be issued after application with the appropriate fee. I think that reads better as well. More easily to follow. Yep. Unless it's over 90 days, and then it, then if they don't record it in 90 days. They don't get the building permit. Right. That's <laughs> Then the, then the next sentence says, the appellant's legal rights set forth in a variant shall expire if the construction involved is not substantially completed. I'd like to change that, I'll tweak that just a little bit. That's language from the zoning ordinance. It is? Yes. Shall expire if the construction is involved? That's what the ordinance says? I think that's where I got it. Mr. Chairman, may I request about a two minute recess? We are in recess for two minutes. Race, yeah. Construction or alteration involved is not substantially completed.
Okay, back to the application for variance. Any other comments? Um, yeah, the first the first sentence I would ask you, Bruce, to consider strengthening the wording a little bit. Um, I prefer to see it read an incomplete application or failure to submit all supporting documentation with your application will routinely result in the zoning board tabling your variance appeal to the next meeting. Will routinely has a lot of wiggle room in it, so it gives us the option to deal with things. But we don't want to get the message strongly across to the applicant that. How about instead of routinely, say likely, will likely result? Yeah, it's, I'd like it to be strong. I thought about that. I'd like <laughs> to be as strong as possible without being irreversible. I think in most cases when somebody submits a couple of items to us at the time of the hearing, we routinely will not table the matter. Yeah, routinely suggest history. And uh, we haven't got that. I think that saves us too. <laughs> the reality is, is that in most cases, people will present only a few items to us at most. Yeah. And, and we will go forward. I think the it's been usually when people are presenting something to us, it's a pile. So most applicants usually do present supporting documentation and materials at the time of the application. It's these special cases where we've had a pile of stuff come in. And no matter what you put in there, that isn't going to make any difference. <laughs> I, I realize true. that. And I, I was trying to find a way to word it that gave it strength, but also preserved wiggle room for us in terms of what we actually do at the time of the meeting. gave it apparent strength, not necessarily legal strength. I kind of like likely better. I think it'll, I think that would. Okay. I, I think that the language as, as it is isn't bad because it may result in, that's kind of true, it doesn't completely go with it, but it's not saying strong, but it will likely result in, is more like. It's fine. Okay. I think routine makes it, it sounds like procedural, procedural history. So the language is will likely as it stands. What what is it? Will likely result. Yeah. Application not so. Uh, the application will likely result. Your application instead of may. Will yeah, an incomplete application or a failure to submit all supporting documentation with your application will likely result in the zoning board table and blah blah blah. An incomplete application or an incomplete application or failure to submit all supporting documentation with your application will likely result. Should that first paragraph be bold? We can make it bold. <laughs> Love Make it capital letters too. Go on. Underline it. Bold. We can print it in your blood. Okay. Or the applicants. That's a good point. I mean, if we'd have material down here that's bold, italicized, and maybe that sentence up. There. It is the most important thing we're trying to get people to understand. Right. Maybe that sentence would be bold, italicized. Bold, italicized. Well, we've, we've, that's the format that we're using further down to draw attention. How do you spell that? Italicized? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on the application, Bruce, that you want us to comment on? Dr. Chapmas? On item number four, if that if the lead sentence were broken into two separate sentences, it might be more clear. It would read, a site plan using one of the following, colon, a mortgage inspection plan, comma, a sketch plan drawn by a surveyor, or a stamped survey, period. The site plan should show the following, colon.
That sounds good. Chris? Yep. Does that, does that sound okay? Yep. Great. Are we saying the site plan shall show the following? Or should? What were you suggesting? Either, either is fine. Shall. Shall. If that's made a separate sentence. Bruce, is that something that we're requiring be included well, on a plan? Shall and should really directs them to supply that information myself, so I don't think it makes much difference. Shall, you want shall? Okay. Site plan shall show the following. What about the last section in uh, uh, F? The last sentence, if it is not feasible to take actual measurements, then approximate as closely as possible. Haven't we been asking them to take physical? You can't ask. You, know, you can ask them, but you can't tell them. I mean, they don't, if, if people don't want them to go on the property. Oh, that's a good you know, point. I mean, it's, that's. Right. I mean, they can measure their own property line, but. I, I, that's how I was reading it initially. The point you just made clarifies it. Okay, are we done with the application? I think Bruce should put his home phone number on here too, <laughs> just for <laughs> What? Your home phone number would be helpful. <laughs> I'm listed. <laughs> Actually, Bruce, you've done a great job. Thank you. Putting all of this together over the course of your tenure, <clears throat> making it very clear to people. An excellent job. And I appreciate the uh, comments by the board. Are we gonna do the rules? Are we going to work on that tonight, or we got that down? The rules? Did we get that down? We're done with that for tonight. Okay. And Mr. Hill will submit a final, hopefully final, revised version to us for formal approval next month. Okay, so Mr. Hill's going to take care of it. Right. Great. I didn't catch that. Any other business? I, I have one thing. Uh, November 28th meeting, so Tuesday after Thanksgiving, is there any problem with that? After. It's a Tuesday after Thanksgiving. No problem. On the like the I do have a scheduling conflict with that. I'll okay. be out of town. You do have a conflict? I do. Anybody else have a conflict? Could you repeat what you just said? The, the, the meeting after is the next meeting is, is the number 28th, which is a Tuesday after Thanksgiving. And I wanted to just make sure that we didn't have a problem with, with attendance. Okay. Now, okay, the, the other one uh, is December 26, which is the day after Christmas. And it's between that and New, New Year's. So what would be the board's wishes on that meeting? I would suggest that we find another time for our meeting. Yes, I, agree. I would as well. I, won't, I would not be able to make that one either. Um, is that a calendar? What are our options, Bruce? To move it up in the month of December? Well, or I would think you'd want to move it back a week rather than back into you January. Pull it forward, you'd want to pull it into January, so then you wouldn't have a month of meeting at all in December. I don't know. I meant move it forward in December, up into mid December, the, the week prior. Okay. That would be fine. It'd be the twenty. Be the nineteenth instead of the twenty-six. Sounds good to me. I know ahead of time. Gives me an excuse to put off my Christmas shopping one December more day. December. December. December nineteenth. Uh, submissions would be have to be in by the fifth. November stays at the twenty-eighth. Any other business? Is there a motion to adjourn? I make a motion we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.